lovely um so thank you so much everyone for joining us um as i mentioned earlier um this is going to be recorded and then we'll put it online so anybody who wants to watch uh who can't make it they can watch it again um this is uh part of for festival uh, as part of the artist talk series where we also invite external professionals to join the conversation. And today we are speaking with Niall Sargent, Sinead Morin and Hans Vandermeer on the sustainability of our farming industries, the balance between food production and good stewardship, and to talk a little bit about unsustainable farming practices and the systems that support them. So I'll introduce our speakers. And um, we have Niall Sargent, who's a multimedia investigative journalist for Noteworthy a platform by journal media publishers of Ireland's leading online news source. Niall's work focuses on issues related to climate change, biodiversity, ecosystem services, and food production. And prior to his move into journalism, Niall worked as a criminal intelligence analyst with Interpol. Um, Sinead Morin is a Trinity College natural science graduate with a master's from NUI Galway in climate change, agriculture, and food security. She has professional experience in the environmental and development NGO sector. Sinead and her partner Mick returned to farming now and managed a mixed herd of cows on a 27 acres in the west of Ireland. They are passionate about conserving the species rich grass mature trees and biodiversity that is found on their farm. They're unconventional farmers. Their objective at Glanbui Farm is to produce food that is fair to people, place and planet. They bottle and sell organic raw milk and eggs to the local community. And last but certainly not least uh, is Hans van der Meer, who's a documentary photographer through photography, film and writing, he examines the world around him. Uh, you may know him from the project Dutch Fields and European Fields about football in its original form, which brought him international acclaim in the art world and beyond. He's published a number of books such as Achterland, The Netherlands Off the Shelf, and most recently Time to Change, The Changing World with the Dutch Cow, which is currently exhibited as part of the group show Bite the Hand that Feeds You at Fort Ireland Festival in Rathfarnham Castle, Dublin. And you may also have spotted it on billboards around the city. And if you have, don't forget to scan the QR code to be taken to a specially made app uh, developed by Paradox. So in Time to Change, Hans is looking at and thinking about cows and consequently dairy farming, animal welfare, uh, high tech food production and its impact on the environment, which is what we want to speak about today. Um, as I mentioned already, please be aware that the conversation is being recorded and may be shared publicly at a later date. Feel free to pop your questions, your thoughts, your comments into the chat or the Q&A box so we can share them. Thank you. And um, so I would like to start at the start, I suppose, and ask each of you how everything began. Perhaps, uh, Hans, um, I understand that this started for you uh, when you were asked to look after your friend's cows when he went on holidays. And before time to change, you actually had a project um, where you photographed uh, farm animals. Uh, and I think it was all about that moment that they look at you and they question you. So there was a lot of seeds, I imagine, planted already for time to change to happen. And um, perhaps you could tell us how you started to work on specifically on time to change. Yeah, uh, I was actually I was commissioned by the, uh, the Netherlands Photo Museum. Um, to pick a, a project from their archive, they have a huge archive, um, and they uh, they came up with a book called Rundve, which is a kind of a situation in Netherlands in 1948. Uh, photography by Kars Orthuis, uh, a, a famous Dutch uh, photographer from the 50s, 60s, um, and he started just in the war already, or just after the war, commissioned by, at that time, the, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture to give a kind of um, overview of the situation. And when I was commissioned to do that, I was already uh, 15 years, 16 years um, at my friend's farm for, you know, every, every year, two weeks, he goes on holiday in summer one week and uh, one week in winter. Actually, I met him because he's in Dutch fields. He's the guy on page 64, throwing the ball. And I met him in that village where I was photographing their football pitch. And we became friends and he asked me, uh, well, can you look after our farm when, when I'm um, going for a ski camp, a ski holiday in Canada? So the first time was in around 2000, 10 days. And uh, at, from then on, we were always asked when he was not there to do that. So 
I, when I was asked to, uh, by the Dutch Photo Museum in 2015, um, I didn't really do a lot with the topic, apart from the fact that I made a children's book called Counting Sheep, and the photographs I made at, at the farm of my friend Jaap. Um, but the, the milk quotum, as we say, was about to, uh, to get free. And, and I did a lot of um, urban work before, a lot of, uh, you know, like the Netherlands of the Shelf. And I wanted to return to the countryside and to the animals. So it just came in time. And well, I started to uh, first in the north of the, of the country because there was an exhibition planned in, in 2016. I started to publish in one of our leading uh, newspapers. Uh, basically, uh, I was literally, as it says on the back of the book, I was kind of intermediate between the people that, uh, you know, lived in cities and no longer had any idea about what was going on on these farms. And also, you know, when I, have, for instance, earned interns, uh, people coming to me uh, to have an internship, I noticed that they knew so little about food production and about you know, how things go. So yes, I felt when I was publishing in a newspaper, it really felt I have to kind of catch up. Uh, I have to kind of talk to people in an informative way, but also in a personal way, uh, not only about my experiences on the farm, that helped me a lot because I, when I was talking with the farmers, I interviewed a lot of farmers and I photographed a lot of situations around these farms. Um, but for me, from the beginning, it was clear that I, I didn't want to photograph the farmers themselves, but I wanted to use the cow, the animal, the cow, the phenomenon of, of, of the cow uh, and what they have been seeing changing over these years in the Netherlands and the industrialization that really started post-war in the Netherlands. Uh, had, had a lot to do with the, with the hunger winter, if you say, you know, we, we were in 1944, um, a lot of people starved because of the hunger. So after the war, the, the, the Minister of Agriculture, they said, we can never have, have a situation like that. And then we, we took all the things that were already happening in the United States, we kind of imported them to our country, and, and farmers became huge industrial, uh, big, uh, um, um, you know, plants almost. And all the developments were, and all the, all the issues that we are struggling with now are a result of the things we have been doing over the past 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and yeah, when I dived into this subject, uh, it was really the beginning also in the Netherlands of, we can't go on like this. You know, we are literally, we are reaching a ceiling of what we can do. And, and the Netherlands, you know, it's, it's, we live in a kind of Delta area on the North Sea and it's a very fruitful situation. It's very, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's really, the land is really almost designed for cows. When we started to do this, the peat lands, which we turned over into, you know, by irrigating and, and making these little water canals. And uh, it's, it's almost a perfect landscape for a cow, you know, to, to have cows in there. Um, but we kind of totally overlooked uh, uh, what we have been doing over the past 50, 40 years when, when this whole um, industrialization started, uh, all the negative effects of it. Uh, and especially, you know, now with, with biodiversity, all the monocultures and, and, of, and a lot of things uh, made us now realize that we have to do something about this. We can't go on like this. But meanwhile, we, we're also the third export, worldwide export in dairy, you know, uh, country. So that's, that's a big debate in the Netherlands. We have, we have a lot of farmers here. We have, la, we have la, about 50,000 17,000, 18,000 farmers. Uh, a small number of them are, you know, like biological uh, uh, farming or how do you call that? Uh, um, biodynamic also. Uh, but things are changing and uh, yet people do realize that, that, you know, we can't go on. And for me as a photographer, it was very interesting to see um, that we are picking up things that we had been doing before, but then in a modern way almost, you know. So I, especially uh, in the last part of my book, 
um, I, I paid attention to these kind of developments that farmers have been developing also themselves and also together with the industry. Uh, you know, it's not it's it's not only about high welfare floors and but it's also about uh, horns coming back on the cows because there are minerals in it, um, deep litter stables, uh, a very medieval way of farming, uh, in combination with modern technology. Um, there are there are these kind of things happening. Also, the breeding is changing. Eh? We don't a lot of farmers don't believe. In the, in the Holstein per for cow anymore, uh, because it, it, it gave also a lot of kind of cow diseases and a lot of problems with the feet and also, so don't do that. My cat is in the firm in my skin now. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so yeah, so that, that was where I picked it up in 2015 and I worked on that for about three years and then we had an exhibition in 2018 and we had the book in 2018. I made a couple of video films. And for me, it was very clear that the cow looking at us was a, was a kind of returning thing in my exhibition, in my book. It just addresses the question of responsibility to us, you know. And the industrial way of depicting cows is from the side um, because, you know, farmers need to know uh, they need to almost see uh, with all the data alongside with it, um, you know, the perfect cow with, with, with the line of the back. And, and so they, they get the information also to, to kind of standardize photography. Uh, but the cow never looks at you. Uh, it's photographed as a kind of product photography. <clears throat> and I just wanted to, to have the same kind of imagery, but then cows looking in the lens, asking almost the question to us, where are we going to? Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Um, and we'll come back to uh, we'll come back to all that. I just want to go through everybody first. Um, oh, lovely cat. <laughs> yes, it's interfering. Um, Niall, your investigative work um, focuses on sustainability, food production, biodiversity, everything. Um, that uh, Hans's work is also looking at and you have done a lot of work in Ireland on like on fisheries on salmon farms we were talking about earlier uh, fossil fuels and so on and you're working on attempting to explain the role of the EU the EU subsidies and other funding schemes play in the Irish farming model as I understand mm -hmm. could you uh, maybe tell us more about this specific investigation so that we can understand better the kind of problems that Irish dairy farming faces in relation to its future and our collective aim of a sustainable future. Yeah, no problem. So I guess the one currently looking at the moment, one of the investigations is called Cash Cow. Yeah, so exactly we're looking at the agricultural subsidy um, model in Ireland, but also you know, within Europe, because obviously predominantly the subsidies would come through the common agricultural policy from the EU, um, which is currently being reformed and it looks like it's shifting in, in a more climate or biodiversity friendly direction, maybe not to the same extent as as environmental NGOs and specialist groups like that were, were, were hoping for, but it's moving. So we want to sort of trace back kind of what Hans was touching on there, like the subsidy model over the last number of decades, where has it left us now in terms of, of biodiversity more so than, than climate? We're looking at that as well, but predominantly uh, the biodiversity impacts. And twinned with that, I'm working on another investigation looking at the decline in species in Ireland, uh, species in their uh, and habitats. And you trace it back over the last number of decades. It's very clear that agriculture in Ireland has, has, has had a significant impact there. Um, it, it's, it's fairly commonly known that agriculture in general has a, a big climate footprint in Ireland, making up over one third of our total emissions. Um, a lot of that coming from, from dairy, obviously, I think it's over about 50% of, of agri emissions, but the biodiversity impacts as well are twinned with that. Um, and a big, big issue is water quality. Just today, the EPA Environmental Protection Agency in Ireland came out with their latest water quality report for last year. And, you know, we're in big, big trouble in terms of not just pristine water, but general, general quality of, of our water sources and, and our rivers. Um, and its predominant impacts are coming in the areas where there's large uh, intensive dairy farming in Ireland. So there's, you know, there's a huge connection there. So we're obviously looking at where the subsidy model has played in that. Traditionally, they would cap in the last while and the way it's been formulated is predominantly based on you know, the, the amount of land in 
productive quality. There is uh, environmental strings attached to it, but I mean, it's fairly clear, it's been argued that they haven't been very stringent. The EU Code of Auditors just published a report, it got a lot of attention. Um, essentially, report they said that there's been a wild failure of success, successive uh, agri-environmental schemes under cap to reverse the biodiversity loss we've been seeing. Um, and intensive farming is, is, you know, still remains a main cause of that, the EU others report said. So, you know, we will, the, the general thing is to look at, look at those, those impacts, um, how the direct payments have been played out and where we're going for the future. And I think, you know, obviously I think it's pretty clear, like everyone knows the cap has not been very good. Those that report said it clear that what environmental NGOs and, and even state reports have been saying for a long time, that the cap as it's currently formulated, um, has not been working for biodiversity and it's been pushing farmers towards, you know, intensive production. The whole idea being presenting, I think, touch on what Hans was saying coming out of World War II and coming out of the previous issues, that it's about having uh, a supply of, of essentially cheap food for the masses. Um, but this isn't necessarily good at all for biodiversity and it isn't necessarily good for farmers either because, you know, when the prices are not good, you have to increase the number of animals in production, particularly for dairy, uh, in order to make yourself profitable. And this obviously has impacts. So the way the next cap hopefully will be going, uh, at least in terms of the environmental side of it, is actually results-based performance. So that's, you know, farmers will be rewarded for showing the results in terms of biodiversity protection. Uh, and hopefully they will be paid more than they have previously in, in other schemes. So like there's been some fantastic models, more pilot schemes in Ireland where this results-based model has really, really worked for protecting certain habitats and protecting certain species like hen harrier, curlew, corn crake, these iconic Irish species that are really in decline on, on the stage of, of um, going extinct in some cases if things are not changed because the breeding populations are so, so low. So the whole thing is if they are protected, the habitats that they exist in are protected and a lot of other species would rely on those same habitats. And also those, you know, if those habitats are protected, there's a better chance that the water quality, et cetera, will be protected. I just, I'll finish on the point that I think is the, is the key part going forward. Under CAP, there's sort of two main pillars. There's the pillar one, which is predominant main payments going to the farmers every year. And then there's a second pillar, which is more about you know, rural enterprise, things like that. And tied in there is the agroecology or agroenvironmental schemes. What really needs to happen is a much larger payment come under the first cap so that it's for everyone to get their payments. They have to have environmental stewardship at the core. And also there can be penalties when you don't do it. Because the problem when a lot of it is in the pillar two, it's predominantly voluntary, at least in Ireland for the most part. And the problem with that historically is that the farmers who have taken up those voluntary schemes are farmers who are in more high nature value areas, which is great, but they're more extensive sheep farming predominantly. So the smaller farms, they're already doing things pretty well because of the way they farm. It's the more intensive farms in the south, the southeast, the southwest, um, the, the southeast uh, and around my areas of like Kildare, where there's large tillage as well, but also a lot of dairy and mixed livestock. They haven't particularly taken up those schemes because it doesn't make too much sense for them. The payments aren't good enough for them to take it on because it would impact their profits too much. So that really has to change because those are the areas where we're seeing the biggest impacts in terms of biodiversity loss now in climate. So I think that's a, a key thing that has to get across that has to change. These things need to not just be for some of the farmers in the northwest of Ireland, it has to be for the entire country. And they really need to be, I think, incentivized better to do that and encouraged to do it. And yeah, that's where it needs to go, I think, anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, Sinead, of course, Glanbuy is also very focused on uh, biodiversity. It's not just about the, um, I suppose, if you could just tell us, explain to us about Glanbuy and what it is that you're achieving there. Um, because I, at first, when I came across it, I, was, I, I thought it was kind of focused on the animal, which of course, it is but also biodiversity is a huge um aspect of um your goal no uh yeah definitely um we were really lucky um as might have mentioned we farm in the northwest so we were really lucky that our farm was uh, extensively farmed for generations so we uh, we haven't kind of inherited a, a farm that was intensely managed and having to bring it back so when we inherited our job was really just to 
I suppose, conserve and uh, maintain it as it was and improve on it where we could. But we quickly realized that to do that and to farm in any ways that would allow us to make a living, we would have to very much remove ourselves from um, any kind of current, I suppose, agri-system as it currently exists. So we realized very quickly that we would have to have control of not just inputs and what we put in, but also the of what we put out. Um, so we're quite a small farm as well. We'd be quite typical um, of farms in the west of Ireland. Uh, the average farm here is about 36 hectares. You know, we have 11. So we're, we're quite small, but typical of the northwest. Um, so we decided that we would, uh, based on basically history and old stories about the farm and uh, names that are on the farm, like our name is Glambui, which means Yellow Glen. And, that was one field that every May comes up in buttercups, uh, birdfoot, threefold, these little flowers. Um, and the story is years ago, they would have milked uh, the house cow there and all the milk was churned for butter because when she grazed that field, they got the richest butter. So that kind of name and other things kind of gave us the idea of going down this route of a micro dairy. So being a small farm in the Northwest, we actually um, are based in Mayo. So we get one payment through the Common Agricultural Policy, which is called the ANC, which is an area of natural constraint. So we're deemed just to be a poor quality marginal land. So when you start from that base, um, it's quite easy to feel that you're outside the model of it. Um, we de don't deem our land marginal, we deem it quite beneficial. Uh, but we, as I said, realized that we'd have to operate outside of that cap system to make a living of it. So we uh, bottle and sell milk direct. We milk once a day. We work with uh, cows and breeds that would be more traditional and um, not big yielders, but that's fine because obviously the price that we get is completely different because we then also sell direct to the customer. We share as much as possible through social media with the customer so that they are as involved with how we farm rather than what we sell, if that makes sense, so that they're really getting this deep connection of farm to fork. Um, our model is, uh, everyone always asks us, is this <laughs> scalable? Um, I don't think so. I think there's elements of it that are. And I think, as Niall has already mentioned, with the cap, there's massive potential within the cap to begin that shift because at the minute for the majority of farmers who are supplying into the global food market they are very much caught in the trap and for in any ways to for example say plant multi-species pasture to bring biodiversity back onto the land that's going to impact the yield based on the cow that they have we'll say that impacts the yield that impacts the pocket so all these things Unfortunately, CAP can do so much, but also the market has to change as well. And that then comes down to power, you know. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting how you said about the, um, how you said about the land being um, of poor quality or useful. Sorry, I can't remember exactly how you phrased it. <laughs> There's an Irish photographer, Miriam O'Connor as well, who is working around those topics. Um, she has a farm as well. and. Um, it's kind of who deems land useful and what, what is useful land and what is usable land. Um, thank you. Um, how many cows do you have actually? I wanted to find out. We have 12. They're very small. <laughs> You're lovely. I love, um, you mentioned social media as well and I just love, love your social media. Thank you. um, one of the things we spoke about in the previous, um, in a different artist talk, just last week was this kind of automization of farming and um, this rapid disconnect that is happening with the animals, um, which I think is um, also kind of, uh, you all mentioned as well. Um, and I think what I would like to ask both of you perhaps before we go into that is when you were looking at Hans's work, um, like what are some of the parallels that you could spot between the Irish uh, dairy industry and the Dutch dairy industry and maybe some more obvious differences or how did you feel about it? Um, this is kind of for all of you, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, Let you, you go first, Neville. Yeah, sound thanks, man. Um, yeah, the first thing for me actually was the cow on the front. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because she's red and white. Now, our cows would be red and white because we have short horns and, and moils. And um, that wouldn't be a cow that you would see on a, on a 
what would be deemed a now a traditional dairy farm in Ireland. We typically kind of have gone with the uh, British Friesian and in particular Holsteins um, and the, the Kiwi cow, as they call it, which is the Jersey Friesian cross. So a lot of the breeds were the first thing that kind of stood out for me. And um, after that, particularly on when you're, you know, you mentioned about not the photos of cows and taking them where they're actually looking at you that is rare to ever really get that because particularly in agriculture the cow is seen as um as a unit of production in some kind so when you are photoing them you're taking a very different angle I suppose so that also hit me but then after that there was so many elements um this one I've left it open because mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to show it this is what we now call zero grazing um this to me has never set well but for multiple reasons um, on an environmental front it makes absolutely zero sense to begin to take the cow off the land um, for the cow it you know we can do and I can see here because I know in the Netherlands you have to have um, well I call them a cow scratcher but it's here in the back of your photo because um, cows do love an old scratch uh, we can kind of provide different things within that indoor environment to make the cow comfortable, but whether actually satisfying her needs as a, as an animal to socialize and to do different things, I don't know. Um, and also, yeah, zero grazing, you'll hear lots of different uh, positives about it in the fact that it's because we are quite wet here in the West, it's very good for farmers in the West because cows aren't poaching the ground, so therefore it saves the soil and for me, we can say a million different things about it, but I think the minute we begin to remove a livestock, in particular a ruminant grazing animal off the land, um, we've really got to question what are we actually farming here anymore. Um, so yeah, so like there's definitely lots of similarities and as Niall has pointed out, I think you're definitely a decade ahead of us, but the last <laughs> year, the last, uh, since 2015, since the quotas were removed in Ireland, it's been like in speed everyone you know on speed in regards to the kind of progression in the dairy sector and you know money is is not a question like when we started out if we wanted to borrow two hundred thousand to to rent a hundred acres and stock it with a hundred holstein cows the bank would have given it to us when we said we wanted 10 to milk them and sell it direct they no interest so it might be a decade ahead but we're we're catching up <laughs> <laughs> yeah well it's it's i i think uh, as i said we are ahead and we're always uh, on the way back for partly so uh i i think uh when when farmers have like over 150 200 300 400 cows um that's also for the herd you know it's uh it, it's not it's not a good thing but um and, and generally, I would say we should, I mean, my project was not against farmers, you know, it was, I, I think we should stand alongside farmers and we should, we should really understand what the problems are. And there's a huge industry around them that almost, you know, also the banks and, and also the, the, the big companies um, um, will provide them with, with, with all the, the food so, and things around it. So it's it's that big industry around them that you know the milk price isn't very high and it's it's very difficult uh, as you say for them to change you know uh, once they are taking over a farm from from you know from sometimes generations you know in the family uh, and and until 2015 uh, when the milk quotum was was gone i mean it was it was really a situation where everybody got crazy in terms of uh, multiplying almost the number of cows and so on. But soon after that, people realized that, you know, the, the phosphate ceiling and we had all these kind of problems with, with minerals uh, uh, and the regulations from Brussels forced us to, uh, you know, to hold back. And, but it, that, that's, only, that's only a particular part of it, you know, the, 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 major, the, the, the bigger problem is uh, I think a worldwide food production problem. I mean, we are we can talk about Ireland and the Netherlands, but uh, uh, quite often it's said that extensive farming we can't feed the world and so on. But there is now 
luckily there is there is a huge development in in um, also uh, artificial meat production and also um, you know uh, the kind of um, companies that are I I, I wouldn't want rid of milk but we don't need it in a way um, and we can we can get rid of of a lot of just the negative things around this and we can we can keep the quality of it we can keep the beauty of it and it's it that's that's the big challenge now how how do we get rid of all the negative things around this and i wouldn't it's not only even maybe only the number of cows you know it's it's it, it, it's i think it's it's much more complicated um and when you're really going deep in this topic and you go to china you go to saudi arabia and you go and you see all this also a lot of our farmers had internships in the united states and there they learned that you know why don't we have a thousand cows you know when the, when they when they went back to the netherlands in the 60s and the 70s and they had an intern in canada or in in you know in the usa they just thought, well, I'm going to take over this farm, my father with 30, 40 cows. Why should I do that? You know, and but so they they were kind of programmed in a kind of setting and of kind of grow uh, growing numbers, but also in terms of getting out of a, one cow 12,000 liters a year in, instead of 6,000 or 5,000, which is much more. So the whole, the whole, the whole Stein, everything changed towards the perfect perfect cow perfect in terms of i mean the picture you showed me is a perfect example because the farmers you talk to which do so say yeah but i can i can much more control my production per cow when i keep them indoors mm -hmm. because when i when i send them i mean literally they can they can almost um uh, per cow they can almost you know be be in control of minerals and feed and so on but that's ridiculous you know because the original animal is not meant to do that and a cow that is in the field and uses nose and uses and uses its tongue you know to to do to do that job herself um there's there's a lot we lose we lose all the beauty and all the healthy stuff uh when we go we, we pick up the milk and we bring it to a factory and we we do this homologization and we lose all the beauty which is in there uh, and it doesn't make sense you know because the animal i mean we use only 10 percent of the capacity of what it could be in terms of our health and our uh, and 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 that is what we are now learning or you know we are now learning that we we have we have to develop a totally new way of looking at it um, but but people who buy products in a supermarket should be informed about these things and should be informed about that they are part of it you know i i filmed i filmed a couple of those situations where you see uh, a hoof trimming for instance and it looks absurd um, but it's not for the farmer because he's been growing into this you know for him it's it's a development but when we look at it from a distance, we see something very strange happening with a cow in a, in a kind of machine. But don't forget, when you're sitting on your terrace and you're drinking your cappuccino, or you're ordering your pizza, it's you, it's you, you. It's the chain reaction of it's you doing that, you know, we are doing that. And that's the kind of awareness we, we have to develop together with the farmers, you know, that, that it's, it's a big chain of all these events where we're all part of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so my book wasn't yeah. wasn't against the farmers. It was alongside the farmers mm -hmm. uh, to, but also to to stand next to them, but also to to say, look, uh, we have been going maybe we've been maybe taking the wrong turn off, but we can go back and we can we can we can go back on on the right turn. You know, we can go back on the main road again. <laughs> Because people are doing that, and that's the, be the beautiful thing is that people are downsizing. People are going back to things we've been doing before, um, and yes, subsidies and subsidies and so on will help them to do so, and the real price will help them to do so. But we, 
it's it's a mindset it's a mindset that we have to develop and the mindset for me is not only that we all have to become vegetarians or veganists the mindset is that we have to uh but that's a general thing also in the topic what i'm working on now it's a kind of planet repair issue that uh this is this is a part of it but it's it's part of a very big worldwide problem totally agree I think I... It's super important just the but everything's a kind of a reflection on our consumerist demands and it's the farmers or the food producers that have to kind of play catch up but sorry now you were saying yeah no it's just because i think it's been covered very well and Sinead covered a lot of, of of my thinking as well in terms of the 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 linkages between the two cases there's just uh just reading looking through the book and reading through it there was one particular line that stood or section that sort of stood out to me in terms of the the phosphates derogation that um <clears throat> that the netherlands had and how similar it reminds me to the nitrates derogation in ireland um i just said we always had a good explanation for the special position because we're such a fertile country in the river delta the soil is perfectly suited for grassland and we could only guarantee the special position by keeping to the agreements on the phosphate standards and to me like that's the scariest thing for me is that we have a very similar image presented in ireland that we're per, you know we're perfect for grassland we're perfect for the system the, and, and in terms of the nitrous irrigation it's almost this idea it's always going to be there we're always going to allow be allowed to have this derogation despite repeated reports from the environmental protection agency from other agencies even from you know agri research body here chagas and others that you know we're going to have to get this thing under control or we're going to get in trouble with the european commission again um and then we might end up in a similar situation that's obviously happened in in the netherlands um and that's my big fear that we should really be looking at this sort of reporting from the likes of hands to show what look at the positives in terms of how they've tried to change things in the netherlands but also that all the sort of more technical solutions aren't necessarily a real solution. They may not work because as we're getting more intensified, we're going to possibly have the same situation. And we have a lot of farmers, dairy, dairy farmers in particular, like Sinead was saying, you, you can go into debt very quickly and the banks were very happy to support you uh, to expand in that way. And I, look, a lot of dairy farmers get quite annoyed at me when I, I talk about the, my fears about the debt, but that is my biggest fear for the, for the sector that, this might be coming out of line if there's bigger issues with the prices going forward if there's major um interruptions to production from from is the impacts of climate change like i said eu legal action against ireland that we have to change the system to hit our targets um ultimately it's those farmers that are going to get hit with this um and it's again like hans was saying as well it's not you know you're, it's not against farmers here this isn't is not easy choices like i uh, you know my family we ha we have about eight hectares of agricultural land like my family is traditionally from a farming background i know a lot of people <laughs> when they see my work wouldn't necessarily think this but you know um, we rent our land um most of it to one of my best friends who's a mixed livestock farmer and you know we've talked about the situation in dairy many times and he sees what's potentially coming but because the prices are also so bad in his sector, he may have to move some of his production to dairy as well, just to try to keep his head above the water in some ways, even though he's quite successful already. You know, so this is the wider impact of what Sinead was saying about pushing our agricultural production into a global commodity market, um, removing this localized production that I think Sinead is trying to reconnect with. Uh, and the fact that, as Sinead said, there, there's no box to tick for her for the supports, really, for that sort of farming. And that's unless that changes i think ireland could be going down the same way as the likes of, of what's happened in some ways in the netherlands and what's happened in in new zealand as well which i think has a, a good influence on on the irish model as well thank you um and also one of the i suppose predominant features in the project as well is um the role of uh, technology in kind of improving farm management um, I suppose with the aim to drive um, not just financial but um, I suppose now there's also technology that is trying to drive also environmental sustainability um, and um, it's one of the things that we spoke about uh, last week with uh, David Hunt actually and Daniel Salais and um, this kind of as I was saying like automization of farming um, and I wonder, like on a more kind of, 
I suppose maybe a philosophical <laughs> scale, um, there's this kind of disconnect that's perhaps happening between the animal and the human uh, with, I think Hans mentions it as well, like things like artificial insemination, and then you have the separation of the calf and the cow and the milking is automated. And um, and like last week we were talking about like ag tech as well. Um, and um, I'm just thinking about also kind of the evolution of the cow and not just the physically the evolution of the cow, but its behavior as well. Oh, well, not just the cow, but kind of any animal. Um, and I don't know, are we like potentially looking at the future of fully automated farms? <laughs> Or not? Um, I know that there's a lot of obviously small farms still, um, like you were saying, going back to uh, more traditional methods. Um, and I suppose I wonder if my question might be, um, what would it mean, what, or what does it mean for the evolution of the cow having this less kind of human and other animal or animal interaction? Um, and just how it's quite quite interesting how the this is causing less interaction between. I'm talking about the big kind of big industrial uh, farmer and animal, and yet somehow the technology is also bringing us closer because we have this suddenly this intimate knowledge of um, where they are, what they're up to, how they're feeling. I don't know your thoughts on this. <laughs> the future <laughs> of the animal, basically, the future of the animal, the evolution of the animal, this behavior. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah go on, sorry, uh, no, I just might say some very quickly. I'll let you. Yeah, go. Uh, you'd have a, probably a better picture. Of this. I just think, <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's obviously mixed things like there some. I see for me it's like the smaller technological fixes that have a great impact in terms and and still has that connection in terms of having an app on your phone so you can have a view of your you know your sheds at certain times of the year so you can see if if, if a cow is birthing and you can get down there in time it, it'll have an alarm that can wake you so you're not you know constantly <laughs> under stress at certain times of the year to be waking up every few hours like things like that are great and uh, and have an idea of the weather and the soil quality all those things because they can have you know environmental benefits because if you can see the results of say for example change into a mixed species sward or whatever it might be uh, you can see the quality and the milk yield whatever it might be for proteins etc but um, yeah, I guess there's some somewhat of a, f a fear I may have is in terms of too much automation. Like I'd follow, there's a really good Twitter, I think it's Ireland Farmers, and they they change every week, I think. And you see you see the real range of, of different farming from extensive to the more intensive. And obviously, I think dairy would be the one with the most technological advancement in that regard. And farmer, some farmers going now with like you've seen in Hans' book, the, the ro milking robots systems and, and the automated milking system, which, you know, in a way that's very good for the farmer's welfare in terms of um, working hours potentially, because that's obviously a big impact, particularly on, I, I think on dairy is the lack of holidays, the lack of downtime, mm -hmm. the, and the Sinead smiling, <laughs> just like that. It, you know, I don't, that's just one thing I don't think people realize the amount of, if you have, land in different parts the amount of driving you have to do in any day the amount of of work that goes into it um so it can be positive in that sense i guess that the potential downside is if that sort of system encourages further expansion then um and the cost of all this technological advancement because like i said if it drives you into more debt even though you know on paper it looks like you can pay that debt off over a certain period of, of time if these other non-technical more natural problems flare up if it's drought if it's too much rain if it's other climate impacts um you know it could leave farmers in a very difficult situation with you know it sounds like a very strong thing to say but potentially stranded assets um if things have to change so i guess it's weighing up what sort of technologies are most beneficial for the farmer but also in terms of the environmental side of it as well and that we have to be careful of allowing technology to solve some of those short-term problems and keep expanding and leave some farmers potentially facing, you know, into machinery that in 10 or 20 years time might be, have little value to them, unfortunately. I think- I've been visiting uh, a few farms where, where you can really see uh, that kind of future, but they are, sometimes they are really, um, you know, they're really, um modern progress or how do you say that very modern deep litter stables mm -hmm. where the feeding goes almost automatically the milking goes automatically um but and but they have high welfare floors uh, so there is this the problem of ammoniac is uh, solved by um by the high high welfare floor and yeah it's there are sensors 
everywhere and 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 these kind of things uh, every time you have to realize uh, where is it good is it bad um, a good example is maybe wireless fencing i think is a kind of development that's really tricky uh, because technically we can we can we don't need even fences you know we can we can put something around the car we will literally control it uh, on distance by by swiping on on on, a, on an ipad but do we want do we want to take away that kind of freedom from from animals that's a very ethical question and there are there are more of these kind of ethical things in the backdrop of breeding also you know we can do a lot of things but do we need, really want them to happen um and in that sense you know i think th this is really something uh that shouldn't be uh, left by the industry it's that's something that as a that's you know as a society we should have a debate about these things you know do we want things like that to happen um uh, so yeah there but in general i i i don't believe that technology should be the problem i think you can do good things with it as well i think the problem is more uh, um that we have to develop a totally different way of how we deal with planet earth and that can be part of it uh yeah i would agree um i think technology uh definitely has a, a role to play going forward and um, i think with everything it's got to be about balance um, and then it, for me, I would also have to include, uh, I suppose, the mindset, which you mentioned earlier, Hans, and there's definitely a mindset issue. Um, I, I find personally for me, technology that further removes the farmer from, um, from animal and from land, I don't necessarily think that's always a good thing. Because I think if there's anything I've learned, having come coming back to farming is the, the, the nicest thing about farming is feeling that connection to whether it be the seasons and um, to the animals, the good and the bad, <laughs> the land, the good and the bad of all these things. And I think um, that gives me a particular mindset that would uh, inform other decisions that I make then. And I just think sometimes with modern technology in agriculture, it is always still driven by making something more profitable or more efficient rather than necessarily being about the cow or the farmer and um, you know we can bring in robots uh, to milk the cows and yes it gives a particular agency to the cow where she can choose to be milked at a particular time but she's milked by a machine and if the machine breaks down the farmer doesn't have the ability to fix it anymore he has to bring someone outside from to do it so you still we're still heading down this path of bigger farms less farmers with technology that's kind of where it's going where there is other technology that we could use to benefit you know on a benefit kind of side of thing um but yeah like i always remember one farmer saying to me like the more the bigger the tractor is the further away he was from the soil you know? so uh, you know i think we have to to mine that i think that's that's more that's across every industry even further than agriculture in regards to technology we kind of have a habit of as humans of looking at this problem or and seeing a symptom and then treating that system then rather than looking at the overall disease and for me i think that really comes back to the fact that we continue to see ourselves as separate from from earth from nature from nature and um, rather than it we are one and the same and when we damage that we damage ourselves so yeah for sure I don't think we go back to use horses, but but uh, <laughs> no. uh, but 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 in a way, you know, it's it's there is there is there is uh, there is a good reason sometimes to to do things complicated, mm -hmm. and 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 in and I have a I have a nice example of a project I'm I'm I've been working on, on last year um, in the Netherlands. We are very efficient with our water that means we have all kind of canals uh bringing the water as fast as we can towards the sea but we have a huge water problem created 
and a river that goes, you know, bendy, very bendy to the landscape. We kind of removed all all these bends. We made we made a, we made a, the water going straight to the river. But the river wasn't stupid <laughs> because the river was holding the water longer in a certain area where we are now bringing the water as fast as we can towards the sea. And now we created a problem, you know. So, I mean, it's just because we want to be efficient, but efficiency is not always a good thing to do. Yeah. Sometimes sounds, um, sounds even more familiar to uh, Ireland. <laughs> when you mentioned that, we have the very, very similar process here. You only see your traditional rivers in geography books now in Ireland, really. Um, so, yeah, very, very similar in, in, and connected with agriculture as well, of course. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 but but you know these kind of developments like you know learning from nature, biomimicry, learning from nature, building with nature, these are the kind of positive developments we are now into, and and we have to we 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 are doing that. We are learning from nature, and we are and that sometimes means stepping back, and 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 sometimes it means a, a different solution. Uh, but but we should we should be more modest about this and and. Uh, but that's that's we don't have a lot of choices huh? in in terms of uh, what is uh, dictated now by uh, by the climate change and so on so yeah i think um it seems like a the logical thing to do is to learn from nature and to follow its uh um its own systems to create our systems that are in synergy um, and our, earlier you mentioned, and I completely agree with you about how um, it's it's really the kind of responsibility of us, the consumers and the people who are dictating these um, necessities and these in making these demands. But do you think the consumer is, are, are we kind of strong enough? Are we big enough to uh, make meaningful change? Oh. I think I think in a way we we are we are but there's this... are enough of us educated to make or informed to make these the, the correct decisions rather. Well, they they always talk about the 2080, 2080 in terms of there will be always 80 percent of followers and 20 percent of people that are you know kind of leading. I I don't think that will change a lot. You know I I I don't think but but it it does mean. I mean, things are moving, and you always have to to be aware of where where are we heading to, or where are we moving to. But I I think top down decisions, in that sense, are good. I don't think top down decisions work very well always, in terms of, for instance, uh, uh, I don't know how it works in Ireland, but the soil in the Netherlands can be very different for certain farmers, and they really struggle with top down decisions because you know their land in the north is very different from a certain soil in the south and and they have to they have different circumstances so you have to be specific in certain situations but you have to be also very very uh, direct in your uh, in the way especially um, we kind of force almost people to you know to do certain things or not to do i mean there are now big companies they don't want to invest anymore money into um, fossil industry and so on i think yet yeah, the financial world taking responsibility it sounds ridiculous but some some of them are doing it in a way you know they they, they don't want to do investments anymore in fossil industry i mean that's i mean powerful uh nations are powerful but not so powerful as big companies nowadays and big companies nowadays are very much afraid of their public imagery and so on so there is this yeah there is this we have influence you know but we we need to make clever use of it um and and imagery and what we are i mean filmmakers and and writers and journalists and and documentary makers we are part of it i mean the biggest little farm is a very good example uh, i was really surprised when i saw that film I saw some critics in, in, in the Dutch newspapers about the, how the whole thing was financed, which I think is really ridiculous because I think it's, it's a very good example of a filmmaker that, that uses uh, his experience to make that documentary about 
his farm in in uh, in San, in, uh, in California. Which and is and the biggest little farm. You know that film? It's it's a, it's it's a, it's a it's a hit, but not. You know, but it, it's, it, it does work because it does make people think and look different at soil and producing food and so on. With all the struggles and with all the negative things which he also is honest about. But the critic in, in when the film came out, the critic in our newspapers was that the whole thing was budgeted by a million dollars financing, blah, 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 which is not a real situation for a farmer. Which I think that wasn't the, the message of the film. The message of the film was that you can you can have a totally different attitude when you know it's and uh, in the end they created a healthy farm and they sell projects to Demeter or Demeter, how do you call it, which is a kind of biological dynamical worldwide uh, product selling these kind of things. I think, but these films are important. Uh, to create this kind of awareness, to to see, you know, we can we can change, we can do it, we can, uh, same like uh, the, the the people uh, from uh, uh, the, uh, the United States that are doing this uh, agroforestry kind of thing, you know, they and also in Germany there are some good examples of uh, permaculture and so on. I mean, yes, these things these things are being picked up. And and uh, and they slowly they become slowly part of that's that's my clock <laughs> that's my children love this <laughs> they it makes animals noises every hour anyway so um, I mean this if, even even governments are kind of picking up ideas coming from we have already seen in the 70s and, and in the 80s that, that people are experimenting with. It's, it's a slow process sometimes, but it works, you know, and, and uh, I, I'm, I, I don't want to be a pessimist. I refuse to be a pessimist. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would just sort of, yeah, to, to go on that in terms of particularly in terms of like the work that like Hans would do in terms of for me it's vitally important in potentially drawing in new audiences to these sort of subjects um, and making people think about the choices that they make when they go to buy their food because the importance of like in terms of documentary photography or documentary filmmaking in that sense it's you get a real fly on the wall insight into you know the working conditions on on say a dairy farm how things are developing with you know no filters applied no makeup so you see the good and the bad but particularly one thing I drew out of it was even myself like being close to farming like my my, my family you'd look out at all the time most of my best friends are, are farmers I know how many miles they drive every day just to get to different farms you know and the work the the, the you know strength that farmers have to lift these i don't know what how the hell they manage to lift these like 20k buckets of, of sugar and different things to feed the animals but like i don't think people realize how much work goes into it. and that's something i really took from hands is that you see the scale and i think the, i think if more people understood the work that went into it they would look at what they're paying in the supermarkets for the produce and really it should open their eyes to think, how am I paying this much money for this product? Um, and the unfortunate thing is a lot of people are still are aware of that to an extent, but for most of them, price comes first, which I, I find an unfortunate situation. Like I, for me personally, in terms of food, for me, first and foremost is the sustainability of the produce. When I'm buying my vegetables you know, direct from a farmer, I'll pay the bit extra because that's a choice we make. You know, do I need to go to the pub to have some pints and you know get a taxi home at the weekend, or do I spend that extra 20, 30 euro on directly paying the farmer with the dirt under his nails who's you know taking the vegetables from the ground just that this morning? But unfortunately, for like Hans said, for about 80% of the people, price comes before sustainability. Um, but in terms of the positive side, I think there are ways to get around that. Like Hans says, we have to be positive about it. And if you look at that new report that was in Germany on the future of agriculture, you know, they're pointing in a direction it needs to go an overhaul of cap for climate biodiversity. They're bringing in, ta you know, tax breaks to us for people who actually will buy, you know, make more sustainable choices in their food um, production. They will get tax breaks at the end of the year, things like that. And I think 
if in Ireland we would adopt something similar and help support people to make choices to buy food from people like Sinead who are, you know, trying to meet a localized, you know, mar- trying to meet those markets on a local level while keeping environmental stewardship and, and habitat conservation at the core of the work. If the, we make that connection between those sort of farmers and the consumer through tax incentives or where it might be, at the same time having people like Sinead, you know, putting having that connection and showing what they do and that's the great value of social media and like the works of hands doing if we can make that bond stronger and show people the amount of work and love that goes into a lot of agriculture a lot of farming then i think hopefully i I, i'm very hopeful that more people start to make those choices when they go not hopefully not necessarily to the big supermarkets all the time that they might go to their farmer's market and instead i think uh I think, yeah, I think it's a day on the positive. Um, definitely, like our customers um, know us, they know the names on the cows, um, they know kind of how it works. They know that if I say we'll be there on Friday evening, that could well be late Friday evening, because it depends. We work with livestock, so someone might have been playing up and et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, it's really good to have that direct connection. And then when we have gone third party, we've really been picky on who we supply our milk to because we want that person to be our point of contact so that they're as good at explaining our work, what we're trying to do, why the price is the price. You know, I, we've had it, I've had this discussion before about, you know, from a food justice angle, like we charge, um, like our milk retails for 250 a litre. And someone might say, well, why would I pay 250 for that, for that bottle of raw milk when I can get it for 79 cents in the supermarket? Well, the first thing is we won't be in the supermarket um, because the supermarket really is about driving down prices and cheap food at the end of the day. But then for a lot of people, that is their only option because they don't necessarily have access to a farm like us. We can't supply um into bigger areas we can only supply so much at our scale from a sustainability perspective as well so there's other potentials there for other people but the problem is is i think i think if we continue to see ourselves and it's a thing that we've worked on before over the years i think if we continue to see ourselves as consumers then we're forever going to be directed we are, as consumers, we are advised what to eat, we're marketed at, and we're always marketed by price. Um, whereas if we actively see ourselves as a part of the food system, whether that's as simple as getting to know your farmer or getting to know your produce or the seasonality of your produce, you know, like our dairy is seasonal. Um, people are kind of going, what will I do in the winter? And I'm like, well, you know, it's kind of the way it goes, but you, you can't, you can't, want to only have milk off from cows that are eating um, species rich grass when it doesn't grow in the winter. So <laughs> it's just how it works. Um, but we have that direct connection to explain it. So yeah, look, at, at the end of the day, this the food system is the problem here. And the food system is very much designed to keep me, the farmer, as far away as possible from you, the end producer. And, you know, companies within that, yes, they are afraid of their reputation. They are more aware that the consumer is more aware of environmental issues and biodiversity issues. And we're already seeing that greenwashing come in. And then we begin to focus, say, on the cow perspective, because we're talking about cows and dairy. We focus on the carbon footprint. So we try and get a cow to produce more milk, one cow to produce more. You know, it, it's, if her yield is bigger, we can reduce that carbon footprint. We can play with statistics to make something look greener. But at the end of the day, for as, for as long as I'm at this end and you're at that end, there's too much noise in the middle um, where things are, are, are going to be lost in translation. Um, and I think while the consumer definitely has power um, to make certain choices, uh, different things will impact that as well and you're going to have to have both a top down and a bottom up I think to find again that balance in the middle. I agree totally. Yeah I think that's brilliant as well um, how you uh, kind of you're talking about this uh, gray noise in between the statistical because yeah it is easy whether as a consumer or um, professional to get carried away with these uh, the figures and the um, trying to do the right thing and at the end of the day um, 
it, it, it can be, it can become noise, as you described. Um, and I think both of you also, well, all of you went um, really nicely into my kind of last um, seg segue nicely into my last question, which was um, kind of about the role of the creative people, of the artist or of the photographer, of the even the yeah the journalists, the filmmakers, etc., um, in kind of mediating these um, important issues to the public. Um, and I think I'm not going to ask that question because I think you already answered it really well. Um, but I think that's also something that's quite important, um, I suppose, to me personally, um, is this relationship between um, the creative work that's then rendered into our other practices uh, that are not art practices like science or our daily life, etc. Um, so and perhaps I could uh, leave it at that if you agree, unless you have some specific questions for each other or anyone in the audience has a question. Um, but I want to say like a huge thank you because um, I think it's been really enlightening and it's been really, um, I know we couldn't go too deeply into the conversation because the, we could be here for a very long time. Um, but I think it's, I think there's just some really good points made and it has been really enlightening conversation. Um, and it's been a really an honor and a pleasure to listen to you all. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I might uh, leave it there for today. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm looking forward to finding Grand Vuy maybe on my travels because I don't think I can get it in Dublin. <laughs> no, you'll have to come to me over it. <laughs> Which is my favorite part of Ireland anyway. So. Hey! <laughs> I hope to meet you one day. Well, well, yeah. please, Han, stay in touch. You've got our email. So if you ever make it to the west of Ireland, yes. call in. It would be great. I, will, I, will, I would love to come over with, with my daughters and... and uh, yeah and do a tour they they both play the violin and we have some fantasies mm. about going to pubs and so on <laughs> oh well that's my favorite pastime <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you so much everyone thank you right. thank bye. you bye, bye. 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 bye.